um, I think I'm going to present on the pharmaceutical patent system that uh, developing countries have by force been now asked to implement. Uh, I'm going to talk about the TRIPS agreement, which was a part of the World Trade Organization's um, portfolio of agreements that developing countries had to sign if they had wanted to join the World Trade Organization. And as a result, a patent system which is almost globalized is entering into many, many developing countries, particularly middle income developing countries like Thailand, Brazil, South Africa, India, and a large number of other Central Asian countries and Latin American countries. So there are two aspects to, to the whole debate on access. One is the fact that what is currently available is too expensive or what we really need is never developed because there is no market. So there's a market failure on both sides from access and innovation. So if we are, for example, wanting to treat um, HIV, often when we, were, when we were starting, we found the drugs to be too expensive. So they, these were drugs that was just starting to be uh, used in, in Western countries, but we couldn't access them for our patients. So we were forced to give palliative care. And when we, for example, wanted to treat children, we didn't have pediatric dosage because who, you know, they had managed to eliminate literally uh, pediatric AIDS, excluding a few, few cases in the United States and other developed countries. So why make pediatric dosage? So you do the trials, you get the patent, but you don't bother to make the pediatric dosage. So often innovation suffered because you didn't have the, the, the pharma companies did not want to invest in the kind of research that was very necessary for developing countries. So you had to adapt. Uh, treatment, you had to come up with newer um, products that were suited to developing countries. If we found that drugs were unaffordable or, you know, diagnostics were unaffordable um, and existing medicines and diagnostics that could very quickly be used in developing countries were not available uh, or could not be procured because of their price. Um, they were unavailable, for example, um, you had a situation where um, with TB, you had drugs out of production, you didn't have new molecules, so you were struggling to even provide very basic TB treatment. And particularly now, the, the crisis has been quite acute because of DRTB. And of course, everything that was developed was developed looking at, for example, the climatic conditions in the West. So, you know, we don't, even today, we don't have heat stable vaccines. You know, you, you shipping vaccines across this country, can you imagine? And you have fridges and you can't come up with, with heat stable vaccines. So, you know, often what you have is completely unsuitable for developing countries. And we just have to live with what has been developed for, for um, other countries. Uh, but in all of this debate, India has played a very crucial role for MSF. And that's why we, we continue to, to work alongside the Indian government. For rare occasions as civil society, we do actually work with the, with the government quite quite, quite strongly. So what's the history in India? Uh, Post-independence, we had very high prices. Uh, we had many parliamentary committees who documented those high prices. There were monopolies by GSK and Abbott. Uh, this was the era when the first antibiotics and the first drugs were coming out. We just couldn't make them. We didn't have the know-how, and they were the highest prices in the world. Uh, we changed all of that. We did away with monopolies on, on medicines and food. So there were no product patents on, on medicines and food. Uh, we set up public sector units who would then train people, medicinal chemists, uh, produce the raw materials. Even the Russians refused us know-how when it came to pharmaceuticals. So we just had to do it uh, the hard way and, and get our medicinal chemists uh, to, to formulate medicines. And then from that, we transferred all the know-how into, into private sector companies. So basically, from 1972 to 2005, what really happened was that Indian generic companies became the pharmacy of the developing world. Now, this was not the intended policy objective of the Indian government or Indian lawmakers, but this was a default and, and I would say a nice side effect of what we did on, on uh, making ourselves reliant in the production of medicines. This is how it really worked. If you had a patent, there was one producer, no competition, high prices of imported medicines. Then we switched over to a regime where there were no patents, multiple producers, competition, low prices of locally produced medicines. This is, this is exactly the model of local production that India followed. And of course, in 2000, all of this was very, very influential in influencing MSF to take up AIDS treatment because we believe that drugs 
uh, could be made in India and shipped to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, one of the first uh, public um, challenge to the whole system of intellectual property was when uh, fluconazole was imported by treatment action campaign illegally into South Africa. They actually took medicines in their pockets and they went to the customs authority said we've got it and we went and held a press conference and said we've got fluconazole come Pfizer come sue us if you if you have this thing there was a big civil disobedience movement that was built around fluconazole and I think it just sort of powered the entire HIV movement to take on the intellectual property uh, brigade particularly the companies like Pfizer um, over a period of time, after having working on the kind of com fixed dose combinations and the formulations you needed and on the quality, you see Indian companies uh, bring down the cost of HIV medicines by July 2006 to, to about less than $150. The original charitable price to MSF was $10,439. For so they gave it to us as a charitable price. It was over $15,000 and they were being very nice and kind to us, these pharma companies, by offering us these AIDS drugs for $10,000. MSF was not willing to ac accept that status quo. Our doctors had already started putting patients in Thailand and in South Africa. We had to negotiate prices and find an alternative source. And then we started to negotiate with Indian companies who gave us better prices, but also gave us a f better formulations in terms of what was needed for developing countries. So innovations like fixed dose combination, pediatric dosages came from Indian companies. They were not powered by intellectual property systems, but they were powered by the kind of competition that the Indian market had on, on pharmaceuticals. And this is a very famous Durban March where two pills a day saves lives became a historic war cry for the AIDS movement to try and get people onto treatment in, in Africa and other countries. Uh, the lack of patents allowed Indian company, generic companies to innovate much simpler treatments suited for developing countries. So both on innovation and access, MS, uh, India's model was really uh, paying off in, in terms of HIV AIDS treatment. And today if you look at it, uh, China and India basically, uh, China being the big producer of raw materials, APIs, uh, and India being the big uh, producer of uh, formulations. So literally, if you look at 50% uh, of worldwide prescriptions are generics, majority of of what India exports goes to developing countries and uh, it, 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 this, is, this is now uh, raw materials are coming from China, India is making the formulations and majority of these drugs are now being shipped and there's a very, very healthy trade in medicines going on between developing countries between India and uh, China and India and then India and other countries. And of course, we were faced with the globalization uh, problem of, of the patent system. And India was faced with a 20-year patents on pharmaceutical products. And that was really the tragedy. Just as we discovered the power of generics and the ability to scale up treatment, you had to do away with the generic model because you were faced with the TRIPS agreement. And this is 2005. Everyone was worried, including MSF, or what is going to happen uh, to, to procurement of H HIV medicines from India and other life-saving medicines. Patent applications were skyrocketing in India. So even before the patent system had come in, in anticipation of the fact that India was going to grant patents, you see by 2005, we have 25,000 applications per year. So patent applications, patent claims. You don't have that many new drugs, but you have many, 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 many applications. So they were piling up a patent office with the kind of applications that they, they would normally do in any developing country. Uh, MSF's prognosis was that if a patent was granted on any key antiretroviral, it would very quickly go out of production and there would be a crisis in AIDS treatment and that's why we started to work uh, with India on this issue. Um, the problem came home with probably everyone sort of heard about imatinib, but imatinib is really truly a fantastic cancer drug. It saves a lot of people's lives. It was invented with public funds and through the efforts of an oncologist called Brian Drucker, who indeed deserves a lot of uh, credit for, for working on this drug. Uh, unfortunately, the IP was owned by Noatis, and they went after uh, monopolies in India based on the applications they had filed. Now, these applications never got examined. Just because they had filed a patent application in India, they were given a five-year monopoly, and the prices uh, started to skyrocket because what they did um, was they got a five-year exclusive marketing right, and they forced Indian companies to go out of the market. Cancer Patient Aid Association, who was subsidizing the cancer treatment to $20, I mean, Cancer Patient Aid Association said, how can we pay Noatis $2,500? We don't have that kind of money. So it, we had to go to court. And the court basically didn't listen to us because 
they were like patterns we don't understand anything about it and probably the patent office has done a good job of granting something how do you how even do you qu even question the system so that's when we realized that we had to do something really big when the 2005 deadline came for the trips agreement this is what we did we got together we mobilized everyone across the world from bangalore to South Africa, everyone on the same page. We call up our friends and said, we have a crisis in this country. Look at what is happening on cancer drugs. This is just about India, but there were many, many people who supported us across the world. And then we asked for five things, which I think are very good models for governance of patent systems for other developing countries as well. We said, you have to examine patent applications. Just because a patent application has been filed doesn't mean it's a good innovation. It could be something which is old. You could take two drugs and put it one pill. It doesn't really mean it's an invention. Number two is, let us as patient groups file oppositions on patent applications. Pharma companies are filing hundreds of applications on a drug. Let us give us the right, the legal right, to go to the patent office and show them that these applications are not on genuine innovations, but on the same old molecules. That was the second thing we asked. And of course, we said, we wanted compulsory license. We want a good patentability criteria. That means, basically, if it's a new molecule, a new compound, and it has been invented in this decade, then you give a patent. But if it's something that from the 70s, and you give it a new use, then please don't grant it a patent, because this is not really um, incentivizing true innovation. What you're doing is you're abusing the patent system to grant to get more and more monopolies. That was the patentability standards. I'm not going to go into the other provisions, but I think these three these three were the key of governing any patent system in any developing country. This is the examination system in India. We do not grant patents blindly. We examine a patent application from Pfizer or whoever it is. We do not assume that just because Pfizer or Novartis has filed an application, it has to be valid. We go through it, we test it, and then if required, we allow people to oppose it, and often we find that they are rejected because they are actually not genuine innovations. So this is what happened with imatinib in 2005. The moment these safeguards came into the law, Cancer Patient Aid Association filed a pre-grant opposition on imatinib. It was a missile salt, and Novartis was unnecessarily trying to get another patent out of India more than a decade later. And what happened was that it got rejected because the important thing was that it, the compound had been invented in early 90s when India did not have a patent system. So it, it would have meant retrospectively we are giving uh, protection for an invention which was very old. And this is what happened. They immediately rejected it. And of course, the Novartis case was born. But it opened up um, access for a large number of cancer patients who then went back, were able to access either $200 which is, not, which is a lot of money, but also Cancer Patient Aid Association went back to subsidizing a lot of cancer patients. The cost of imatinib in India is uh, 9,000 rupees a month. I'm not very proud of, of the 9,000 rupees tag that the Indian companies have put, and I'm even less proud of the fact that the Indian government refuses to fund this drug uh, in, its cancer, in, in its cancer program. But of course, if you look at South Africa, and you just see it's more than 174,000 uh, rupees, um, there's some relief for patients who, who can manage to pay the 9,000 uh, rupee tag. Uh, we stopped other K AIDS drugs from being granted patents. There was lamivudine, zidovudine, tenofovir, disoproxyl, fumarate. A large number of drugs were rejected. The patents on them were rejected and they went into production, fueling not only, I would say, uh, AIDS treatment, but the scaling up of AIDS treatment from 3 million to 8 million it happened because Indian companies were confident that they would not get sued in India for, for making these drugs. Uh, this has all been done because we were able to use the legal safeguards in the patent system. Now, very quickly, if you look at um, what happens in South Africa, and I'm giving you a, a contrast because it's important to understand what's happening in patent system. South Africa, applications are filed. You pay the money, you get a patent. No examination, no questions asked. Right? So this is what they've done to one compound. The base compound has got a 20-year patent. Then they combined it with ritonavir, they got another patent. They came up with a polymorph form, they got another patent. Then they got it on an intermediate. And then they combined it again with tenofovir and got another patent. And how many years did they delay the, uh, the entry of this drug? By 12 years. So 20 plus 12 years 
is 32 years of patent protection in South Africa for a drug that we need now in our own projects. We cannot get this drug right now in South Africa. This is how they've done it in South Africa. So focusing on quality is just absolutely important for patent systems and for governance of patent systems. Now, if you look at the same applications in India, the base compound was not patentable because we didn't have a patent system. We took, we, we used the TRIPS flexibility really well. We went till the last moment of 2005 to introduce a patent system. We rejected the patent with combination with ritonavir, the pseudopolymorph, the key intermediate, ritonavir and tenofovir, and we saved about 24 years of monopolies on it. Just plain simple. Just two different countries governing the patent systems very differently. And this is what we see on a drug that is so old, linocilid, and no one really wants to use it. You use it for XDR, TB, which is the last salvage therapy. Uh, in India, it's 10 rand, and in South Africa, it's 600 rand that we pay Pfizer. And of course, they can take the monopoly up to 2021 when it expires in 2014 because of the lack of examination system in South Africa. And they refuse to govern the patent system in a manner that would uh, help their own procurement system. Uh, cancer drugs. You can just compare the prices. It's, it's insane. Imatinib in the Indian market is about 46 rand. In, in South Africa, this drug is 863 rand. And it's not even provided by the public procurement system. Every cancer drug, you will see huge differences within Indian prices and South African prices because they're patented over there and not patented in India. So it's not only an HIV problem, it's also a problem for non-communicable diseases. So what are we asking of the South African government? Fix the patent laws. You need to fix your system to be able to deal with the kind of abusive systems uh, pharma companies have for evergreening of patents. Very quickly on a safeguard, which is very, 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 um, usually under controversy. When you have a patent and it's abused, what do you do? You allow competition in the Indian market. Uh, Thailand has done it. India has just done it and brought down the cost of a cancer drug to uh, from $5,000 to less than $200. It's a not a very good oncology drug. I won't say it's the best, but for the few patients who are buying it from the private market, it's a huge relief not to be, not to be faced with a $5,000 price tag in the, for a month's treatment. Um, this is the first CL in India. It's on oncology drug. Uh, Bayer basically had not even given 2% of patients who needed it. Uh, the drugs just not available. And of course, uh, they were charging uh, Indian patients who could afford it $5,000. The rest, of course, didn't ever get it. Very quickly, in two minutes, I'm going to do the free trade agreement uh, because I think it's linked to what we did on the, on the patent system. Even before we got used to the patent system, we were hit with these negotiations on free trade agreements. And these treated agreements had lots of intellectual property in it. And as usual, we didn't know what was in it. So we were negotiating great deals with Europe, United States, Switzerland, and we didn't know what was in it. Why? Because developed countries said, you are not entitled to give your people the text. So we didn't have access to the text. So we had to depend on civil disobedience. We kept going back to the Commerce Ministry, and we mobilized at least 10 times before we got the leaked text. This is what we did. We basically got beaten up so we could get access to a, some bureaucrat felt sorry for us who, who said, come on, I can show you one, one copy of the text. This is what we had to do. I cannot understand under which governance system, why are we not entitled to the access a copy of the text? Even organizations, all corporate bodies have access to the text, but no patient groups or MSF or anybody who's affected by them has access. This is a very key issue with pre trade agreements. And of course, they ask for more and more intellectual property. They ask for data exclusivity, which is not about patents. It's about data in the drug regulatory mechanism and monopolizing the safety data that exists. Um, if you look at this drug, I'm just giving one illustration. It's an old drug coming from traditional knowledge, used for goiter, coming in a formulation, and it jumps to $4 from a few cents because some company did a trial on 50 patients and stuck the data into the US FDA. This is the kind of system they want, to, want us to adopt. Uh, many countries have gone through this free trade agreement and they've all paid the price for it. I can give you new innumerable studies which show that and many, many reports have documented the impact of data exclusivity and other. But that was not enough. They want to enforce intellectual property, stop drugs going from one country to another, which is India to Argentina, India to 
sub-Saharan Africa, and they brought in IP enforcement. What will they do? They will even file cases against treatment providers like MSF. We have never been sued for IP infringement, but technically under this text, we can be sued. Our bank accounts can be frozen. We are actually criminals, according to the European Union. <laughs> Literally, they've put in all these provisions in the free trade agreement. Um, and the worst part of the free trade agreement, and that is a key governance issue, are the investment provisions in, in free trade agreements. They allow pharma companies, they allow tobacco companies, they allow food companies to sue our government in private arbitration, where we cannot see a single document. Legal aid groups cannot go there. And they are all in ICSID and UNCITRAL, which are dominated by the Europeans. UNCITRAL is dominated by, by the Europeans, and ICSID is dominated by the World Bank and the United States. What are the cases that they file? So if you bring in plain packaging or bigger warnings on your tobacco packs, we'll sue you. Absolutely. And how much does it take to defend yourself? About $8 million to defend yourself. Can you get access to the documents? No. Can I go and defend uh, my own country? No. The investment lawyers, which have to be hired at a huge amount of money to do this. And this is not enough. They even sued developed countries. They've soon just sued uh, Australia under the Hong Kong Australia bits. They have constantly threatened the same kind of cases on pharmaceuticals. They have long threatened Australia and New Zealand. They will, all, they will not stop at the opportunity of threatening India if we allow such provisions to, to proliferate in Indian um, investment agreements. So what have we done? We've used free speech. We've used all the democratic uh, rights that we've had, uh, including uh, mobilizing, uh, protesting, free speaking up, criticizing the governments. And I think the democratic framework allowed us to do a lot of these things. Um, and of course, we are left with a very broken R&D system, which is again a very, very big R&D uh, governance issue. And we know that the R&D system is not delivering for our patients in many developing countries. We have very few new TB drugs. And if you look at innovation, the patent system is supposed to drive the innovation system. Majority of patents are on Me Too drugs. They are not on new molecules. And what is very interesting and positive about governing R&D is that the WHO's expert group has suggested a binding health R&D instrument which is nothing to do with intellectual property for a change. It is to do with sustaining and coordinating R&D. This is the biggest opportunity we have to actually have a sustainable system. And I actually see it as a very big governance issue of R&D, rather than just about how do you fund this drug, how do you get this diagnostic. It's also about governing R&D. And this is where I would end, because at least something positive to fight for. <laughs>